And I grew up in a family. My daddy was married to my mother when he decided he wanted to be married to my mother. So, you know, we were separated. There was all kinds of dysfunction, alcoholism, sexual immorality, everything that was under the curse was running through my family. But somebody told me about Jesus one day. And when they told me about Jesus, I remember that there was no food in my house. And it was eight of us. And my grandmother was living with us and my mother. So that was nine people. And I opened the cabinets up and my grandmother said, I don't know what I'm going to do. There was literally no nothing in the house. Hadn't seen my dad in a while. Well, I went out in the woods because I was with those Pentecostal women at my church. And they told me God would answer prayer. Now, I'm born again, don't know a lot of the word of God, but they told me this. God will answer prayer, and God will take care of you. That was all I had inside of me. And I remember just as clear as I'm standing today, I walked out in the woods far as I could to get away from my family. And you know what? I didn't, you know, didn't speak the word like I know it now, but I said, God, those ladies told me you would take care of me. Now me and my family don't have any food. You feed us tonight. And I was out in the woods and that was all I knew to say. And I was walking back to the house and I heard a truck come up in the driveway and it was my daddy with the back end of his truck full of grocery. We hadn't seen him in a while. That was my first prayer that I knew God was real and God was a provider. You know what I'm saying this morning, like Pastor said, Christ in Janice is my hope of glory. Ever since I was 12 years old and we became to know God, it's been my hope of glory. It's been my foundation that, you know what, I'm not crazy. I, I'm not on Prozac. I'm not, you know, I don't need drugs in the morning to get me going. Christ in me is Hallelujah. The glory. You know what? I thank God for just knowing that, that I'm lost without God, that I am desperate for him. Like a deer panted after the water, so my soul longs for God. <laughs> All my life, God has been good and faithful. Amen. And I thank God. You know what? When my family would have just been in even more chaos, my prayer, I didn't know much word, but I knew God protected me and my family. You know what? You have, you, you, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And I say to every young person in here, you don't have to be on Prozac. You don't have to be crazy. You can live a life that is so good in Christ Jesus. So this morning, I'm just praising God Amen. for that prayer he answered way back in the woods. He heard my cry. Amen. He answered me, and he's still answering me. He's still my provider. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Amen. See, sometimes we forget where we came from. Amen. That's, I don't mean to keep rehearsing the fact that you were in sin. There are times we forget how God provided for us when we were just getting started. And now we get here and all of a sudden we think he can't provide for us anymore. The same God that provided for you then will provide for you now. You know that song they sing, he'll do it again. Just like Moses, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. Hallelujah. Just like Daniel and the lions, then God will you know, do it again. Amen. Janice was giving her testimony. I was reminded, I was reminded of that when I was little as well, and I would lay in bed at night, so sad, um, growing up in a dysfunctional home just as her, you know, my dad was an alcoholic and he also had a gambling problem and, you know, um, a lot of times we wouldn't have very much money at all and um, just a lot of chaos, you know, instead of peace, chaos. And I used to lay in bed at night and I had dreams, you know, and I would talk to God and about the dreams I had for my life and um, things I wanted out of life. And I just want to tell you, he's a faithful God. He is so faithful. And all that being said, 
I want to say, no wonder the world wants to take God out of schools and take God away from children, you know, and try to keep, you hear these nice little things like, oh, I want them to make their own decision when they get older. I don't want to push it down their throat, you know. All this junk that the world would say. Jesus said, allow the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. And there is nothing like childlike faith. I want you to know a child will believe God at his word. Whatever he says, they'll believe it. Not a stitch of doubt. They just take it and run. So I encourage you, any children that you have, a, 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 a uh, words, any children that are in your sphere of influence, thank you Father, any children that you have an opportunity to bless and to say to, tell them about the Lord, tell them about his faithfulness, tell them about how you can believe, just like Janice's family told her they told her, and so because they told her, what was she to believe but what they said, that childlike faith. And God is faithful to hear and do when a child comes to him in that childlike faith. So just speak the word, tell those children the word. Get the word to the children. We are living in times where we need children praying as well. We need children praying. So tell them, tell them, tell them. Glory to God. And then secondly, just a quick announcement. Um, ladies, we're going to have our um, annual fall get together like we always uh, do in the fall right before the holidays. So we're going to have a um, Saturday morning, uh, I believe it's November the 10th, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm sorry if anybody's already made plans, I apologize, but Saturday morning, November the 10th, we're going to have a pre-holiday get-together. We're going to, I'll have a sign-up sheet on the board out there, but also it's going to be an ornament exchange. What's an ornament exchange? That means you come with a 5 to $10 ornament that you want someone else to take home. And everyone comes with something to give away as a gift and then when we all get here we just put our ornaments on the table and we pick a, ourselves a gift it's that simple but so everybody be sure and bring you an ornament with you okay and of course if you want to bring something more than a ten dollar one or if you want to bring more than one because you want to bless somebody or you want to bring one for everybody to take home whatever but at least bring one, okay? All right, bless you, and I think that is it, except one more thing. <laughs> I just, on my way this morning, I was singing that song, praise the Lord, you know, I save it all up, it just eventually has to come out. But on the way this morning, I was singing that song, um, oh, how does it go? Um, Bless um, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, uh, what you are to me. How does it go? Somebody help me. Because of who you are. Thank you. And that's the key point there, because of who you are. Um, you know, God is who he is to us as we believe who he is to us. Do you get what I'm saying? You know, if you think he's stingy and barely got enough, that's what he'll be to you. The Bible says we can limit him. Let's take the limits off of him in our lives. Let's let him be. This morning I, I printed out the, the seven uh, redemptive names of God. And, of course, I've got teary eyes now. I don't even know if I can read them. But he's Jehovah Jireh to us. He is so much to us. He, I, I'm not going to go through all of them. But the point is, read your Bible, find out who he is, and then walk in that. Believe that because of who he is. 
because of who he is to us, we can walk in this life victorious. But if we walk around thinking that he's a God of destruction, oh, how can you even walk believing that he would do anything constructive for you when you think he's destructive? No, you've got to find out what he is in the word of God and believe it for your life and walk in it for your life. Okay? He is a provider. We're living in times right now. And I, I was reminded, I'm going to finish, I promise. I was reminded of a message that I ministered probably a year and a half ago talking about being on the rock and how when storms come. How many of you, I mean, I know we're, we've just lived through Sandy, the storm out at the, um, in the ocean, but how many of you know we're living in a time where storms are prevalent in our country, in our nation, in our city? But we can be solid standing on the rock of God's word through that storm, and we won't sink. We won't go down, but we will stand strong. But you know what? We've got to believe what his word says. And we've got to believe that he is who he says he is in our lives. Hallelujah. So today I encourage you, stand on his word, read his word, and find out who he is. Find out who he is and then believe he is that in your life today. Amen. 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 Praise God. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Praise sure. the Lord. Okay. I'm sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't think there's a fourth one in there. <laughs> there's not a fourth one in there. All right. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, you could have read all seven of them. They're always good to hear. Amen. So Hallelujah. Here Paul Isn't said that, right? that we, we that we pray and desire See, there's a desire that goes behind effective prayer. Mm -hmm. Amen? If we want something, we're going to have to have a desire for it. And that's why, I, I'll tell you, Janie was talking about how, the, you know, our kids, you know, the, let the kids choose, let the kids make up their mind. She, I was reminded of the story that, that they used to do in the, Soviet, in, in the communist countries. They would take the communist kids when they were small, and to prove there was no God, they had them clear their desk, close their eyes, and bow their head, and ask God to bring them some candy. And after a minute, they say, open up your eyes. There'd be nothing on their desk. They said, now close your eyes and pray and ask the government to supply you, supply you candy. And while they had their heads bowed, they walked around and put candy on their desk. They taught the children that the government was their source, that the government was their God. Yeah. Now, what do you think is happening in this country right now? You can't mention God. You can't pray. You can't talk about God. I mean, why? Because they're trying to teach the children the government's their source and their God, not God. It is the socialist, socialist, Marxist, godless, going to hell bunch of communist people doing this. Now, they can go to heaven if they'll repent. But if they don't, they're going to hell. Lynn and busted it wide open. Hello? Anyway, thank you for your enthusiasm. Jesus died for them too, but they, 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 they cursed God. They rebuked, they, were, they, they absolutely did not believe in God. The state was God. Man is God. Where we, oh, desire. You've got to have a desire in prayer if you want to be effective in prayer. So Paul says, since we heard this, we haven't ceased to pray and, de and desire that. And then, now he's going to have a list of things that he prays for them and desires that they have in their life. Now understand, he's already said that you've heard the gospel, you've received the grace of God, there is fruit manifest among you, but he still prays for them certain things. Now, I want, I, want to, I want to submit to you as Christians. You know, I know some teachings going around, and these teachings are, are erroneous because they, they absolutely advocate the believer of any responsibility to do anything in life or to, or to function in any arena of life other than just kind of sit there under the, under the grace spigot and, and, and everything's just going to happen to you and everything's going to be wonderful. If that were true, Paul would not have said, I pray that. Number one, he, I'm going to go ahead and read all this. Um, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10, I love this one. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every, in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, 
unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And we can go ahead and read more, but there's, I'm just, we're just going to stop here. Notice he starts enlisting us a, a litany of things he's praying and desiring that they walk in. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to you. He's talking to the church. And he's saying, yes, you've been born again. You've experienced the grace of God. But in your midst, there has been fruit of that manifest. But even with that in place, I pray for you that you be filled with all the knowledge of him. Wait, wait a second now. I'm under grace. Why am I already filled? See, the grace of God through faith brought you into the kingdom. The grace of God through faith has equipped, is equipping you in the kingdom. Let me say this. It strengthens you to do things. Amen. God's grace does not abdicate you. It strengthens you. Hello? And one of the first things Paul, well, the first thing Paul said in this prayer was that they be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, the word knowledge is used twice in these next couple verses, and it comes from the word epinosis, which is the clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of God. Clear, precise, accurate experiential knowledge. In other words, you are experiencing this. Paul prayed that they be filled with all the clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of his will. Praise the Lord. See, why? Because faith begins with the will of God. If you don't know what God's will is, you can't operate in faith about it. You got to know what his will is in order to be in, able to be in faith about it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. His word is his will. Amen. We even call it the New Testament or really, you know, New Covenant in his blood. Hallelujah. And so Paul prayed. He said that we'd be filled with all the knowledge. Be filled with the knowledge of his will. Um, let me, let's look over here in Psalm 1 and 43, verse 10. We, we got a truckload of scriptures on these different things, so we're not going to get through any single point real quick. And I'm not going to try to rush. Amen. I could speed talk, but when I speed talk, you don't get it. So I'm, I'm trying to slow down. And, and that part of that problem is I'm, I, I like to preach. And see, preachers always want to get to that point where they, they can yeah, chase it like a dog. I mean, you know, dog after a bone, you know. But uh, and when you're trying to teach something, you can't do that. You've got to back it down a little bit. So I'm trying to notch it down. But if I see a point and jump off and run, I'm gone. Look at Psalm 143, 10. Quicken me, O Lord. For thy name's sake, for thy righteous sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Hallelujah. That is the wrong verse. Oh, verse 10. I read verse 11. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of quietness. Teach me to do thy will. Remember, Paul was praying that we be filled with the knowledge of his will. The psalmist said, teach me thy will. Yes. Amen. Don't you understand that God wants you to walk in his will? Grace, grace strengthens you to walk in his will. But you got to find out what the will is. I'm going to tell you something. When you get born again, you're going to still have to spend time in the Word. Amen. You, can't you can't leave that. You can't. I'm just going to stop using advocate because people are going, what does that mean? You know, kings would advocate the throne. They would, in other words, they would, they would relinquish their right to it. You see, and people, people a lot of times advocate their rights as a Christian because they, because they, they want something different. They want something easier. And so they just won't, they'll relinquish their rights to it because they won't lay hold of it. They won't study it. They won't spend time there. Let me say this. There are things in the Bible. We, we, we've presented, we have presented a case in the word of faith circles, and that's what, I've, that's what I've been for decades. I grew up Pentecostal, came among the word of faith people, that, that everything is, is easy. Brother Hagin said, you know, we teach people that life's like flowery, you know, we're going to go through life like flowery beds of ease, or flowery beds of ease, you know? And the truth of the matter is, you're going to face things. Yeah. You're going to have to put forth effort. Amen? The Bible told Paul wrote Timothy said, endure hardness as a good soldier. Mm -hmm. The Bible says to fight the good fight of faith. All those terminologies kind of do away with the tiptoe through the tulip routine. And I'm not going to tiny Tim it this morning. I'm going to have Nathan bring his ukulele one night and let him do tiptoe through the tulips for you. He does a better job than I do. 
Hallelujah. Just, just so you can be, live in reminiscence of how wonderful that song was as he sung it to Miss Vicky. Amen. <laughs> The truth of the matter is, you're going to have to put some effort forward. Not to get saved, but you're going to have to put effort forward to grow. Yeah. You put effort forward to grow right now. I'm going to tell you right now. They, they can say, dinner's ready, and you come a-running. There's some effort put forth on your part. <laughs> Amen? You sit and look at that food. You don't jump up and slide, slide down your throat. You dive in. Hello. Like a hog-eating slop. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, like a football team at football camp. I mean, I mean, you're slapping it everywhere. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I mean, you, know, you put some effort to get that food in you, didn't you? You're going to have to put forth effort to get the Word in you. Got to come to church. Got to sit in church and listen and be open. You can't sit at home and say, I don't need church. You're, you're just lying to yourself. You listen to a lying devil. You're not going to get enough at home without listening to somebody else. Because God gave a pot, unless you are an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher wrapped up into one, and you're preaching to yourself in the mirror uh, under those anointings, you're not going to get it all at home. A lot of listen to them on television. They ain't enough. Because ain't none of them going to show up at your house and pray for you. Now, Mr. C, I know he watches t the television, television preachers. Now, I didn't see any of them at the hospital when he was going into surgery. I was there. Yeah. Hello? His pastor was there. Amen. Glory to God. So, but you got, we're going to we're gonna have to understand. Here the psalmist says, teach me to do thy will. We're going to have to seek the Lord about his will about things. There's certain things written in the Bible, but you know, there's other things that are not written in the Bible. The Bible didn't tell you to go work for VF Corporation. Mm -hmm. Did it, Dick? Didn't tell you when to retire, did it? That had to be ascertained by other means. And in harmony with the Word, but you had to find out and find out what the will of God was and do it. Yeah. Bobblehead for me. Yeah. All right. Look, look, look at John 7. Look, 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 look. Look at John 7. John's a good gospel for finding out the will of God. Jesus talks about that a lot. John 7, 17. We can back up to verse 14. Now about the midst of the, feast of, uh, of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? In other words, he, 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 was, uh, he was learned. He was articulate. But they, he hadn't been in the uh, university, apparently. And the, and the Jews marveled, saying, okay, and in verse 16, And Jesus answered and said, My doctrine is not mine, but the, this that sent me. If any man will do his, talk about the Father's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. In other words, when you come to walk in the will of God, you recognize the will of God. And you recognize those who are walking in the will of God. That's it. Notice Paul said I be, that you be filled with the knowledge of his will. There's a lot to see. Not just you personally, for you personally, but so that you can discern those that are walking in his will. Now listen, it didn't mean you walk around with a discerning meter and you, you start writing blogs, oh, so and so is not this, and so and so is not, yeah, this one is, that one's not. You're not the, you're not the judge for everybody else. Amen. Amen. Listen, I've known, I've had situations in time past where I knew somebody was walking, were not walking with the Spirit of God. I didn't say a word. I'm, I just let, kept it to myself. Now, I talked to my wife about it. But we never, I mean, the church they were in, the church they were messing up, we never said a thing to the pastor. We never said a thing to anybody in the congregation. We knew this man was a, was a snake. We knew this man was going to cause trouble. But um, you know what? Uh, he didn't release me to go share anything, so I didn't. I wasn't, I wasn't the Holy Ghost there to speak that word. Are you here? You gone home. I stayed away from them, and I, you know, there have been preachers. I mean, you got people going around, everybody, and they just love this preacher. And I'm sitting there going with a sirens going off. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And I think, am I the only one? Amen. But see, when you go filled with the knowledge of the will of God, then you recognize God's will in other places, whether it is or whether it isn't. It doesn't mean you're supposed to go around and blabbermouth it and broadcast it and tell everybody else they're wrong. Now, as a pastor, things come along, and you, you know, I'm not deal, I don't deal with people. We deal with doctrine. Amen. So, if somebody's teaching something erroneous, we're not, we're not dealing with them because them is between them and God. What they taught can affect you, and i got to deal with what they taught. As a pastor, I'm a shepherd. I have to protect you, so I have to teach. I, you know, I'm not against the person, but what's our teaching erroneous stuff, you got to tell the people, this is wrong. This doctrine is wrong. Amen. Hello? I'm not out to get them. You know, as a matter of fact, you want them to repent and turn and be right. 
But if they're teaching stuff wrong, I've got to protect you, especially if it's infiltrating the church. Amen. Um, I, I remember a number of years ago, a number of years ago, there was this young preacher. And I tell you, everybody about on the planet thought he was the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread. And I mean, he was a hot shot. He was doing teaching on apostles and prophets. And, I mean, and the Joshua generation and warring tongues and all this stuff. And everybody just thought he was great. He was cute. He was single. Look, that's why I like. look, look, girls, just because some guy's single don't mean he's of, of the Holy Ghost. My God. On the platform and single. He, he's my soulmate. <laughs> you better be smarter than that. Dear Lord. Come to find out about 10 years later he was a homosexual. And he didn't come out of the closet. Somebody kicked him out. Somebody told on him. And the church was buying his tapes and books and having him in the church taking up big offerings. But I, I, the first time I saw him, something went off on the inside and went, Eek. And then, I, then, and then you start feeling like you're some kind of judgment meister or something. Then there was this woman running around with oil and feathers and blood. Every big name ministry you can think of in this country except one in Tulsa. Promoted her. Had her on their platforms. Brought them up on the television program and displayed her for a whole nation to see. Oil on her hands. Until somebody went in with a slow motion camera and recorded her and found that it was all coming out of stuff in her sleeves. But millions of dollars and seeing them people. See, I'm telling you, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'll guarantee you the vast majority of people that went to those meetings and saw that had something on the inside, but because somebody bigger than them said that was good, they followed it. You don't override that. I don't care if I say it. If, if, I mean, if, somebody, if you see a vision of something floating around the room and it tells you, if on something on the inside of you goes, don't follow that, you don't follow that. And so you can get clarity about it and pray it out and find out what's going on there. What's that? That is because you're being, you're being taught to know the will of God, that you recognize the will of God op operation in others, whether it is or whether it isn't. If you get that, eh, don't, don't override that. You just don't push ahead on that. Why? You can get in trouble. Now, see, people had to get up and repent and say, I'm sorry. You know? Then that woman with the gold dust out of, out of uh, South America. Everybody put her on television, had her in all the meetings, thousands of people coming, and, you know, giving big offers. I'm and all I could think was, man if, you can, man, if you can come up with gold dust, who needs to give you an offering? <laughs> there was just enough gold dust to get everybody giving big offerings. Hello? Mm -hmm. It supposedly manifests right on people's Bibles. On the front. It's always near the front. You didn't have a guy on the back row getting gold dust. Why? She won't back there. Hello? First time I heard that, well, that's not God. Yeah. That's not God. Why? What's the per See, yeah, I believe God does signs and wonders, but His signs and wonders are always for a purpose and not just to get you to follow a person. They're not so you can give a big offering to the speak yes, speaker. Because then you got to listen to what they're preaching. Got this gold dust, and they're preaching jump. They died, by the way. Some prophesied that if, that if they didn't stop, they would be dead. A year later, they were dead. Why? Wow, because God can't let that kind of mess go on. People just throwing money, throwing money, throwing money. See, if you, got, if you have a knowledge of the will of God, you will recognize that in others. And see, Jesus, hear what Jesus said? If any man will do his will... He shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. In other words, you can judge me because you know his will. You can judge what's going on because you know his will. And I am telling you, when you, Paul prayed that we be filled with the knowledge, the epinosis, the clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of his will. Why? Because then you can know whether the doctrines of God or not. God does not want you deceivable. I just made that up. Okay? Never heard it used before. In other words, he doesn't want you prone to being deceived. 
And when you know his will, his epinosis, then Jesus said, you can know the doctrine if it's of God or not. Amen? Yeah. See, as we walk with him and we fellowship with him and commune with him around his word, when somebody starts preaching, it may be, now listen, understand this. It may be something you haven't heard before. In other words, it might be a teaching that's new to you because, you're, because of where you are in the Lord. You may, so let's say this. I mean, if, if, if you're, um, you're young in the Lord, you haven't heard about the baptism, the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues, but if you're, you're walking what you know with God, all of a sudden you realize, because you've been walking with God, and when somebody's teaching that, you'll know, that's, that's God. That's what the Bible says. And you're able to, you're, there's a safety because you're being filled with the knowledge of His will that when something's taught, you're able to discern that or judge that and know this of God or not. Paul prayed that the church of Colossae, now that we understand this, these prayers are not just for the church of Colossae. This happened when he wrote it too when he said it. It is for the church at large. He prayed, think about this now. Yes, you're born again. Yes, you're under the grace of God. Yes, there's fruit manifest. But you need to have a clear, precise, and accurate, and experiential knowledge of the will of God. Now, I'm going to add to that in just a second. Okay? All right? Let's go ahead and read some more scriptures here. Uh, Romans 12:2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. We're teaching that on Wednesdays. All right? Well, we're not going to spend time there because we're teaching on that. Ephesians 5. Keep on, keep on going. Ephesians 5. What does it say here? In verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Y'all ready for something? This goobity got garbage about we just love everybody. And meaning, and listen, the implication of meaning, you accept whatever they say because anything different is not walking in love is of the devil. Yeah. Yes, God wants you to walk in love. But he also wants you to prove if it's of, if it's of God or not. Yeah. That went over big. A lot of stuff that's preached is called preaching the love of God is not the love of God. It's stupidity. Because we're teaching people to accept whatever anybody does as, well, I can't say anything because we need to say something or does it, that's judgment and that's not love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. There's one thing that's just, what the world needs now. In case okay, you've seen some smoking reefer, long hair, bell bottoms, I mean the whole thing. I mean the whole hippie scene. Hadn't had a bath in six months. Just came from Woodstock. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. And if you say, that's wrong. No, you're not love. Nathan was looking on somebody's site the other day, a guy who wrote a Christian song a few years ago. Well, he came out later. He's, he's, he came out of the closet and said he's homo. And now he's got a new song out that's kind of talking about how the, the pastors are, 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 are treating him wrong because he came out of the closet and they're supposed to walk in love. And people are like, brother, I'm praying for you. I don't agree with what you've done, but we, we love you. We're still praying for you. And that was all the comments on, the, on, on, his, on, his, on his feed. And then, and then people come out, you're so evil. You're mean. You have helpful a hate speech. Oh, it's helpful they pray for him and love him. The world, the world... And I'm going to tell you something, the church has adopted it in many places. The world means when they say love, you accept anything I do is right. That's not love. I said that is not love. When my children are doing wrong, I, don't, I love them, but I do not accept their wrongness as right as a demonstration of my love. My love demands I correct the behavior and train them not to do that behavior. That's love. Yeah. Amen? The world tells you, and we just filtered into the church, and we've adopted this goobity got garbage that love is just, you know, we can't ever say anything because you'll make them feel bad. When you look in the Bible, when people repented, they got convicted and cut to the heart. They felt bad. John said, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Your heart will condemn you if you're doing wrong. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. It'll convict you while you're thinking about doing it. It'll convict you while you're doing it. And it'll convict you after you've done it. And it will keep convicting you until you repent. That's how it works. God don't have to. Your own heart will. Hello. Thank you for your enthusiasm. All right. Ephesians 5, 10, we said, what we say, it said, it said, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 17, wherefore be not unwise. 
but understanding what the will of the Lord is. St. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, he's now writing to, he writing, he wrote to Colossae, he said that you might be filled with the knowledge of God. Here he's saying, understand what the will of the Lord is. Why? It is important for you to have that knowledge of the will of God. Now, let me say this. The only place you're going to get it is his word, in, in his word and in prayerful study of his word for the Holy Ghost to teach you. Remember, he's the teacher. To come to an understanding of the will of God. God wants, he said, he thought, what do you say? Look at this. Be not unwise. Oh, I'm under grace. <laughs> it don't matter what I do. That's unwise. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, listen, I know some of you may be here going, what's he talking about? This grace? Listen, I believe in the grace of God. I believe there's biblical grace. I believe grace has, a, has a, a phenomenally important role in our life. I don't believe in this crazy grace where it tells you you can go out and fornicate and it don't matter. That you can live and you can, uh, you, can, you can rob banks and it don't matter. That you don't have to go to church and it don't matter. You don't have to do anything the Bible says because you're under grace. That's the stuff I'm talking about. See, it's going to take, uh, see, and see, if I teach this, some people say, you're teaching law. You're teaching legalism because you're demanding that people go study the Bible. Like it's going to hurt you? Hello? Are you here? You're going home. You're demanding they read the Bible and actually get something out of it. That's bondage. No. There's liberty in the Word of God. Are you here? The Word of God, the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There is liberty in the Scriptures. Hallelujah. And so Paul says, be not unwise, but be, what we say, verse 17, wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Hallelujah. Colossians 4.12. He's on down the road, the Bible here. Four, four, chapter 4, verse 12. I think I jumped too far. No. Nope. It says, Epiditus, who is one of you, a servant of, of Christ, salute you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So some ministers have a responsibility to labor. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How many give me 20 more minutes? 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. That's a, that's a, oh, another, okay. 100, 80, 100, 100, 100. Two more hours. Glory to God. That, that'll spare you most of the Panther fiasco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, every week, every week you watch it, you go, can they just, can they just get any worse? And Beeson went out for the season. That just got worse. Notice he says that, we, that he labors in prayers, fervently laboring for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. See, ministers have a responsibility to do what is important and necessary to help people come to that understanding and to be filled with all the knowledge of his will. But that doesn't always get the big offering. Shouldn't have said that. But it's still true. A lot of stuff is preached because it gets the big offering. Instead of teaching the truth that my brothers and my sisters, you can, Paul's first part of his prayer in Colossians, in, to the church of Colossae in Colossians, is that they be filled with the knowledge of his will. Here he tells us understanding what the will of the Lord is. The Epiditus labors fervently in prayers that they might be perfect, mature, and complete in the will of God. In all the will of God, actually. In all the will of God. It is so important you come to understand God's will. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that God's will is not for you to be a Christian couch potato. Or a Christian grace potato. God's will is for you to study, to feed on, to grow in the knowledge of his will so that you, listen, so that you, what, what did he say in Romans 12 too? So that you can prove is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Amen? So Jesus said, so that you'll know if the doctrines of God are not. 
These are foundational principles to your growth in Christ so that you can discern properly so you're not, as a child, they're swept to and fro with every wind of doctrine. See, children are swept to and fro. Little things come along, kids go, woo! How many have ever seen kids get caught? I mean, let, listen, let's face it. Every year at Christmas, they put on television some toy. And it becomes the craze of that year. Every kid has got to have it. And you're as a parent sitting there going, why? What is so spectacular about this? Because to, in the next year, it'll be something else, and the Cabbage Patch doll won't even be around. But the year before, you were paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars, I mean, fighting folk over them in the store to get the last one, shooting them. Because, because children have to have, you know, they, they're moved by marketing or they're moved by sight. And you know, the church, what is it? Be no more children, Paul wrote. Amen? Tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Winds of doctrine are like new Christmas toys. See, we got a wind of doctrine blowing through the church right now. And people are just running after it because it's hot, it's the latest, greatest. And it's, it's shipwrecking people. When in their heart, and I'll tell you, I've seen people, I've seen people who just thrown away years of teaching because it was so exciting. And the other stuff they're doing wasn't exciting. It was exciting to find out I don't have to even study my Bible. It was exciting to find out I don't have to give. It was exciting to find out I don't have to go to church. Hello? It's exciting to find out I don't have to submit. Woo! I don't have to submit to that pastor. I've seen people, people left our church that did this. Oh, God. Hallelujah. They finally don't have to do it. That mean, evil Ed Taylor said. Spew their venom out on blogs on Facebook. The fruitless preacher of a two faced gospel. Yeah. Oh, evil Ed. E E. E square. <laughs> Evil Ed. <laughs> and all I ever did was teach you you got to do what the Bible says. Challenge you to step up to the plate, listen to the Word, be a doer of the Word, not a hearer only. All we've ever done is say, you can, you're not going to get away with not being diligent about the things of God. Yeah. But somebody that came on and told them they would and could. And it was, oh, it was... I can lose 40 pounds in three days drinking this drink. You know, the Canadian Weight Loss Program. It's not Canadian. I just, I just come up with a name. You know, drink this mixture and you'll lose 40 pounds in three days. Yeah, and we'll have you in the hospital on, on uh, intravenous IVs, putting saline back in your system. Because all you did was drink something that just dehydrated the daylights out of you. Oh, I, you, you can lose weight without even trying. Any weight loss you lose like that, as soon as you stop doing that, it'll all come back with a vengeance. Yeah. It comes back evil. I mean, it comes back evil, evil. You're going to have to, yeah, yeah you, could, you, could, could, you modify your diet, but you're going to have to do some exercise. We tell Christians you're going to grow without diligence. You're going to grow without study. You're go All you got to do is come here and give money. And this. You only have to give money, but we want you to. Buy my books. They'll teach you how to live victorious every day and just sit on your couch and look at Jesus in the heavens. The Bible says to look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. But then the Bible, that same Bible says to fight the good fight of that faith. 